welcome everybody to the uh, North Florida Springs Environmental Center uh, here in High Springs, the, uh, the navel of the universe as I like to call it. Uh, this is the, really the dead center of the Springs heartland. A million people a year come by this office uh, on their way to play in the Springs. Uh, and these are the six classes uh, that they, they basically are a condensed version of uh, Springs Ecology I taught at the University of Florida. The purpose of the class is to basically inform citizens about the problems with the Springs and give you enough information so that you can stand up in a public meeting and challenge some of the notions that we're facing in terms of protecting our Springs. Today we're going to talk about hydrogeology. Just jump right into geology. Uh, this is a geological map of the north part of Florida. The, the Springs region of Florida really starts at I-4, which goes from Tampa to Orlando and is north all the way out to the Panhandle. So that's why I'm focusing on this part of the state. And a, a, ge a geologic map just tells you what's at the surface. It doesn't tell you what's buried in all the layers. Geologically, what you see with the grays and the dark grays, th those are the limestones uh, that, that are the actual expression of the Florida aquifer at the surface of the earth. And so the limestones actually outcrop in our area. Here we are, we're right here in the northwest corner of Alachua County. And if you go down the Santa Fe River, you'll see incredible outcroppings of limestone down there in Chert. Uh, the Indians uh, quarried Chert along the river here, and the limestone is right at the surface or immediately below the surface. Um, and, and that's where our springs are. Our springs are in the same area where the limestone outcrops at the surface because springs are just sinkholes is all they are, uh, where there's enough groundwater pressure to push water out of the sinkhole. So, that's that. The other parts of this are uh, sandy clays. Uh, Jacksonville's got very thick um, uh, clay confining layer over the aquifer over there. You got more clays up here. The Cody Escarpment is a, uh, a boundary uh, that basically where the erosion, the erosion of the more recent sediments has cleared them off. So that's why the limestone exposes the Suwannee River here where the limestone's exposed, the Santa Fe River, the limestone's exposed. But if you go upstream far enough in those rivers, you get into areas that are, are covered with clay, the ground is covered with clay, and so water tends to pond at the surface. And um, it's not, those are not areas of high recharge and, and usually not much in terms of spring flow. In Gainesville area, you've got uh, an area here that's sandy, but it's perforated with sinkholes, like the Millhopper sinkhole, and those sinks are major connections. This is a word I want you to know. Florida is karstic. It's basically made up of limestone, which is a, a, a rock that is easily dissolved by weak acid, and rainfall is weak acid. Uh, so this is the result of that, of millions of years of what we call dissolution, the solution of this calcium carbonate laid down under the ocean uh, by rainfall to make cavities and to make caves and to make pores and and holes in limestone. So limestone is riddled with this stuff. Uh, you can see the overburn here, the sand that's still over this. Uh, but this is a karst environment. It's an area of high vulnerability. You've got nothing but sand stopping water, which doesn't stop water very well from just infiltrating rainfall, infiltrating right into the limestone underneath. Uh, the Florida aquifer is the aquifer we talk about that feeds all our major, all our artesian springs. Uh, and it, its extent is enormous. It goes, it's over 100,000 square miles of land surface now, but actually the limestone mass goes all the way out here. It's the Florida platform uh, out here. Uh, that was all deposited during previous periods of high sea level. Uh, and Florida now is at this level, but the coast of Florida used to be as far out as, as these um, platforms show. And anyway, that's all limestone deposited over the last 40 million years or so, is what I'm told. I can't verify that, um, not from personal experience. But the Florida aquifer has actually been utilized all the way up in South Carolina. It still is to a certain extent, all through Georgia, Alabama, and, and a little bit of Mississippi. And all of Florida is underlain by the Florida aquifer, but uh, you'll see it's not all fresh water. Uh, this is a cross section, uh, shows a sandy layer up here over a uh, surficial aquifer system where there's a confining unit where there's clays down there, like I said, in, in the Jacksonville area. The, there's a surficial aquifer system. You can put a well 
into the superficial aquifer and get water. In some cases, they're just seepage springs um, because they're just where rainwater's gone down and hit that clay and run laterally out to a creek and made a little spring creek. But that's different from the springs that we're talking about, these artesian springs. So these are actually in the limestone. This is, this is maybe there's some limestone here, but it's mostly clay and sand. So anyway, there's intermediate aquifer systems in some parts of the state. The Florida aquifer system, though, is really this whole limestone mass that goes all the way from South Carolina to the, the southern tip of Florida and out to Mississippi. And that's, that's one of the biggest aquifers in the world uh, in terms of extent. Uh, I just found an old report that said uh, it was estimated that it had over a quadrillion gallons of fresh water in it. It's, it's not just in the trillions, it's a quadrillion, which is a thousand trillions as far as I can tell. Um, it's a big aquifer, it's deep and, and big in extent. Here it shows how deep it is, and just in terms of the thickness of the aquifer, uh, here in Alachua County, we're right up in the corner right here, it's about 1,400 feet of the aquifer. But anyway, that's how thick the aquifer is, and it gets uh, deeper and deeper as you go south and forward, and actually the surface of the aquifer gets deeper as you go south and forward too. So the Florida aquifer is not utilized for water supply uh, much further south than Polk County. Almost all of our water used in North Florida is from uh, the Florida aquifer, from this very rich area of, of, of water. This is what it looks like. Uh, it actually looks very different from this unless you have a flashlight. If you have a flashlight, this is what it looks like. It's really kind of creepy when you don't have a flashlight, right? <laughs> I mean, it is as black as black can be. It's like being inside the belly of a whale. It's really not like in the movies at all. It's black. But anyway, when you're diving in there, it's like you're floating in air. The water uh, in most parts of the aquifer is just crystal clear. It's been very well filtered by going through those sand layers. Uh, another cross section of the limestone. Limestone and geologic cross sections often shown as this irregular pattern. You see. Uh, these, these caves and ca cavities, they're not everywhere. They tend to be largest near springs. Uh, basically, it's like a circulatory system in the aquifer, and the, the, the size of the veins and the arteries are larger near the big points of discharge for the aquifer, and those are the springs. And so you have sinkholes. Uh, in some cases, they're springs because there's a pressure, there's water piled up in the groundwater back here. It's higher than the outlet from the sinkhole, so you get spring flow from those areas. But then you have recharge and all these things that happen. And it's a hydrologic cycle. Without evaporation, without rainfall and precipitation, there'd be no water in the aquifer. It's all part of the cycle. It's the same water that's been going around and around on the surface of the earth for as long as we can remember and even earlier. Uh, and in speaking of rainfall, Florida has more rainfall on average than any other state in the country except for Alaska, even more than Louisiana, which is, I think, the second most. We average about, statewide, about 51, 52 inches of rainfall a year. That's the average. And you can see where it is. Most of it, I mean, the highest rates are up in the panhandle. In, in Gainesville, we get about 51 inches, 52 inches. Um, and there, here it says 52. And then there's areas right in the middle of the state that are drier, and places by the coast are wetter. And that's really interesting. When, when, when Florida was a much wider peninsula than it is now, 20,000 years ago, we know from a pollen analysis that Florida was very dry, just like Africa, uh, basically a grassland, and the only water was in sinkholes at that time. And it's because it, Florida is an island. Florida is surrounded by the ocean, and that's why we get the rain we get. But we're at a latitude called the horse latitudes that the rest of the world is desert. So we are at a latitude. We should be a desert, and if sea level fell enough so that the coastline moved out here, we would be a dry grassland again. We'd be getting at much lower average rainfall amounts. Well, if sea level dropped, why would Florida revert to being desert like? Be because we become a continent. We become a continent again and the, these... Break up the evaporation no, the, the coastal, the, this rainfall is, is fronts that are coming off the Gulf of Mexico and so that's why the rain is higher here, that's why the rain's here is because the coastal convective rainfall is coming from those water, those water areas. It's evaporating all the time in the Gulf of Mexico. Every sunny day, you know, there's just billions of tons of water going up in the atmosphere. And then the wind, of course, the prevailing wind in this part of the world is from the west. And so most of that 
weather comes over Florida and gets over the, the, the land, and if it raises that, those clouds enough, it'll make precipitation. And uh, so under some things. So some people say, oh, we, we'll talk about spring flow declines later on. And then some people say, well, they're all declining because of rainfall. Rainfall's changed, you know, there's less now. And, and we have a pretty good rainfall record, 115 years or so, 110 years of rainfall record in the Gainesville area, in the Santa Fe River Basin. And so here it is. These are the annual amounts. And it's, it's really important to know that during a dry year, we get 33 inches of rainfall. And yet the evaporation of water is about 38 inches. So we actually have a net deficit of rainfall during a time like we're in right now. Every spring, we have a deficit for a while where evaporation is typically much higher than rainfall. And so that's why you see our water bodies around here dropping. The lakes, the springs, everything, the water body levels are dropping. And, and plus, we have very wet years. And it's, it, it, the pattern of wet and dry, you know, some people think it's predictable, but it's really not. You know, they talk about El Nino and La Nina and uh, these things. But it, it's, it's it, it, I, I just was with somebody this morning and said, God, you know, the perfect job is to be a weatherman because you never have to be right. And nobody ever expects you to be right. We were talking about the Gainesville Sun's predictions of rain this week, you know, 60% today, you know. But uh, that's what it was on Fridays. And then by yesterday, it was 5%, you know. Um, but anyway, so those are the annual total. <coughs> and they're in the same range they've always been in, okay? There's nothing new over here that wasn't here. Even the uh, rolling average, the, the five-year rolling average, which is this golden line, went up gradually during the 60s and is holding about the same now. The 10-year rolling average is the blue line, which is even tighter. And then the, the red line is a, a smooth average that's a statistically, it's based on the daily data and it's a very good statistical program that gives you a really the sort of the best average of a complex data set. So you can see that it was 49 inches in 1905. It was about 53 or 54 inches in 1960. And we're back around 49 or 48 inches uh, at the time this graph. And, and we've, we've come back some since then. But anyway, we're in the same range as it's always been. If the Santa Fe River springs aren't flowing the way they did 100 years ago, it's not because of rainfall. All right. Um, but that's not what they said in the MFL report. Um, anyway, so we have a lot of water in Florida. We get about 150 billion gallons a day of rainfall in Florida. That's the average daily rainfall for Florida, 150 billion gallons a day. Hi. Um, we get about 25 billion gallons a day coming in in the northern Withlacoochee River, the Suwannee River, the Apalachicola River, and about 2 billion gallons a day of that was coming in as spring flow, actually from springs uh, running off of recharge in Georgia. Uh, but we lose a lot of water, about 70% of all this inflow uh, is lost as evaporation. That's, uh, that's a necessary evil, if you want to call it that. Remember, that's fueling something, rain somewhere else. But that evaporation is what cools Florida. That's our natural air conditioning system. This would not be a green state. This would be a desert if we didn't have that evaporation. That's why the rest of the horse latitudes in the world are deserts, because they don't have the rain to provide the cooling effect and the transportation uh, transpiration effect that the plants need to survive. That's why Florida is a green state, the, la the land of flowers, as the Spaniards called it. And ultimately, all this water, I mean, water is conserved either as vapor or as um, you know, liquid water. And uh, ultimately, this has to balance. What comes in has to go out in Florida. There's no magic supply of water. I mean, this, this, this simple balance accounts for all the water that Florida has. I guess there's Great Lakes water, right, that's being bottled or boxed and brought down, so that changes the balance a little bit, but, but not very much. I mean, look at these numbers. They're, they're amazing. So I already told you about that, but where does it come from? Well, it comes from, it comes from rain. The average recharge to the Florida aquifer, the whole Florida aquifer, including all those areas I showed in Mississippi and South Carolina and Georgia, is about 12 billion gallons a day. So that's it. That's it. That's the income to the checking account. If you think of the aquifer as a, a storage of water that we draw on like a checking account. And, I, and at this time, I was calculating trillions, but now I've read a quadrillion. So we'll go with a quadrillion. A thousand trillions of water uh, are ba basically were stored in the aquifer 
when it was handed to us 100 years ago. So that water, um, how did it come out of the aquifer? I mean, it, it, it went in, it, it was stored, it overflows. I mean, it's like a bucket. It, it can only hold so much water. It gets up to a quadrillion and starts overflowing <laughs> to the springs. And, and so it's been doing that, 12 billion gallons a day going in, 12 billion gallons a day coming out on average, probably for the last 60 years, well, not recently, but the first 60 years of this century, it was doing that. And the springs, like silver, were putting out, this spring alone was putting out a half a billion gallons a day of water. The Kings Bay spring system was putting out um, more than this, about 600 million gallons a day. Rainbow was putting out about 400 million gallons a day. Uh, the biggest springs in the state accounted for like seven or eight billion gallons a day of flow. And then the other uh, thousand springs accounted for the rest. So all a spring is, is a place where groundwater comes to the surface of the earth. That's the definition of a spring. So a, a well is essentially the same thing as a spring. It's, a, it's where it, a spring is where it happens naturally. It's called a well if we produce it. So it's just a place where groundwater comes to the surface of the earth. So a spring does it because of the natural pressure of water in the aquifer. A well does it because of a pump, typically. We pressurize the water. So where are the springs? We say the land of a thousand springs. Um, there, there's the distribution. Uh, these are the counties that have the most recorded springs. Washington County, way out in the Panhandle, has the most. And then Citrus down here on the coast, Marion in the middle of the state, Jackson, Swanee. Uh, we think of the highest concentration of springs actually along the Swanee River here uh, with over 220 springs. The Santa Fe has uh, between 40 and 60 springs. Um, and anyway, there's the springs, like I said, are distributed mostly from Tampa, Polk County north out to the Panhandle. The highest density really right where we are here. We're, we're right at that spot right there. So it's, we're really in the highest density area. We blow up. You can see the springs on the Swanee River. Hundreds of springs, large springs, and uh, the others. Okay, so in the state, uh, the Florida aquifer water, the same water that comes out of the springs, is what we use for water supply. It's like groundwater is used, I think, for 95% of the people in the state of Florida get their water from groundwater. And in North Florida, it's close to 100% of our water that we use for all our purposes, for uh, first magnitude brewing, swamp head brewing, uh, you know, our important purposes, uh, making iced tea at home, you know, washing your dog. Everything is coming from the same source of water that the springs get their water from. Um, and that, this shows the Florida aquifer, the bluish uh, and greenish uh, symbols on here. And, and this is where the Florida aquifer is used as a water supply. It's from Jacksonville West all the way out to the Panhandle and, and in Pensacola area. They have a sand and gravel aquifer that's uh, used out there. Uh, but it's used all through part of Florida pretty much from um, what, whatever's south of Polk County, anybody, Hardy or anybody remind me? Anyway, the phosphate, uh, this part of the state that's been destroyed by phosphate mining, uh, everywhere from there north is where the Florida aquifer is actually pumped. There's like 50 some counties in Florida where Florida, the Florida aquifer is used. South Florida, uh, in Miami, they have the Biscayne aquifer. There's a, a, a undifferentiated aquifer in uh, the Fort Lauderdale, well, north of, in West Palm Beach area and then there's some other aquifers. But the Florida is the biggest one used in, in the state. And the aquifer is confined in a lot of areas by clay, as I pointed out. These brown areas are where the aquifer is confined. There's no, little to no recharge of rainfall in these areas. The, 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 only 6% of the rainfall we get is actually recharged, okay? Remember I told you it's about 12 billion gallons a day. It's about 6% of the rainfall that falls on the Florida aquifer actually is recharged. And these are the areas of highest recharge. It's right where the springs are. The blue dots are springs. And in those areas where the aquifer is not confined is, are the areas of highest recharge. And recharge means up to 20 inches a year of average recharge. In this part of Alachua County and Gilchrist County, about 15 to 20 inches a year of, of our 52 inches of rain actually recharge the aquifer. Very large percentage, the rest evaporates. And there's basically very few creeks in this area. There's almost no creeks that feed the Santa Fe once you go through Alino. Uh, it's because, uh, well, there's, I guess there's Wacoussets, the flats. Is that Cow Creek? What's Cow that? Creek. Yeah. 
I mean, that's the, and, and it hardly puts any water out. Um, yeah. But anyway, that's, that, that's why we don't have a creek system here. We're in a high recharge area in this area where the springs are. This is the map of recharge that's been mapped out. Uh, from this, we can actually go to every county, every water manager district and come up with an estimate of what their income is to the Florida aquifer. And we've done that. I'll show some of that later. But we know how much rain is recharging in the Suwannee River Water Manager District, how much is in the St. John's, how much is in the Southwest, how much is in the Northwest, how much is in Georgia, from these maps that have been produced by the U.S. Geological Survey. And, and as you get near the coast, you're actually in areas of discharge where it's recharge is negative. So yellow, orange, and red, those are areas of discharge. And that's where the springs are discharging. There's some diffuse discharge, but probably 85% or so of the total discharge from the aquifer, the natural discharge, is through springs, through the thousand springs that we know about. Um, and the other discharge is diffuse, and it's basically in unidentified springs and things like that, based, based on the best estimates. So recharge is about 6% of rainfall. Um, what happens then when, when, when it rains on the interior of the state where the ground is higher, remember, Florida's got some mountains, you know, yeah. in Polk County and places. It's 200 feet, you know, above sea level or so. When it rains in those areas, the water is perched higher, and it creates a pressure gradient in the groundwater. And these, these lines, these brown lines, are area, uh, lines of equal pressure called potentiometric pressure or the potentiometric surface because the only way to, to find out where those levels are is to put a well down in the ground. You basically open up the aquifer to the atmosphere and the water will equilibrate at, at atmospheric pressure and then that tells you how essentially what its pressure is compared to other parts in the aquifer. And what you see is the potentiometric high in Polk County is about 130 feet above sea level and then 120, 110, 60 or 80, 70, 60 and water flows downhill if water flows in response to pressure, and usually that's gravity, so we say it flows downhill, but in the ground, water flows from areas of higher pressure to lower pressure. And at the coast, it's basically, here's 10 feet and then zero feet at, the, at, the, at sea level. So water is always moving towards these spring systems, and that's why the springs are down here. And what we can do is actually, by knowing what this uh, map looks like, this map of uh, the potentiometric surface, uh, we can actually delineate spring sheds. We can see where approximately water has to recharge to come out of a spring. So here's the, the Kings Bay um, uh, Crystal River Springs Group. This is one that they want to give away 11% more of the flow of the system. It's already lost 58% of its flow. And, and that's where the water's coming from. But anyway, this is the Withlacoochee River. Uh, and that's, we draw that spring shed, and then you can see how much water is being pumped in that spring shed. You can see how much rains occur, and you can do a water balance when you know where a spring shed is. You can actually use real data to estimate what the effect of pumping is, what the effect of rainfall is, uh, how much water is, should be coming out of the spring there. And that's, that's what we do in all our restoration plans. We've done those water balances. You see all these different spring sheds. You see the sizes. A small spring shed will have a low spring flow. Salt Springs is a small spring. Wiki Wachi is a first magnitude spring. Uh, spring sheds about 300 square miles. Um, Chazowitzka is a very big spring group. And uh, Crystal River is the biggest one in this whole area. Uh, so here's Rainbow Springs. Uh, here's the Rainbow River. Uh, here's the spring shed, approximate spring shed for Rainbow. This is Alachua County. I mean, this, is, this spring shed goes all the way up to Keystone Heights area. There's a high, there's a potentiometric high at Keystone Heights. And that is where the spring shed starts. And Silver Spring Shed goes right down next to it and actually shares this boundary with Rainbow Spring Shed. But you can see these are giant areas. The, the spring shed for Rainbow is 737 square miles. So that's many hundreds of thousands of acres. And Silver is even bigger, or it was. It's no longer bigger uh, because actually as Silver Springs uh, as the aquifer levels have been pulled down, Silver Spring Spring Shed has gotten smaller and Rainbows has gotten bigger. Essentially pirating water that would have flowed out of Silver Springs now flows out of Rainbow Springs. So the things that impact groundwater quality, a quantity, is rainfall. That's the most important thing, and I don't disagree with the districts on that. And that changes based on changes in climate, right? Um, you can reduce recharge by paving over an area 
or you may increase it. There's some evidence that Del Botcher is pushing right now that if you pave over a Marion County, Silver Springs flow would actually go up <laughs> uh, because it would, the water would run off faster, it wouldn't evaporate, and it would get into the sinkholes and recharge it off. Anyway, anyway it's, a, it's an interesting theory. But the net consumption is the one thing we control. We really, we control paving, and, and there are regulations about paving and stormwater management, things like that. But it's the net amount of water we use. The water that we extract from the aquifer in our private wells and the city wells, uh, how much do we put back in the aquifer? And, it's the, and the difference between the amount we take out and the amount we put back is the net consumption. That's, that's really what we have personal responsibility for. Um, in some places, the people don't have that ability to be responsible for that. For example, in Jacksonville, there's no recharge. None of the water recharges the aquifer. They have built no recharge wells or recharge wetlands or anything to get water back in the aquifer. So 100% of what they pump out of the Florida aquifer goes basically either to directly to the St. John's River or to, um, to sh the shallow aquifer which then flows to the St. John's River. So um, that, that's a really big thing and it's very important because we think that actually as we see uh, pumping is leveling off in parts of the state, the amount of being pumped, the net consumption is going up because of, of water conservation. Water conservation, basically you use less water to do something and you actually use more of the actual water and so you're consuming a larger fraction of the water you're using. So even though pumping may be leveling off and they say per capita use is going down, the net consumption can still be going up. And, uh, in fact, we use so much water <laughs> that it's amazing and, and they say, oh, well, look, it's level. Look at that, it's level. Well, whoa, whoa, whoa. What about back in 1950 before it was level? Uh, so this is the total uh, water consumed uh, in Florida for public use. And this is uh, surface water is these little blue squares down here. Groundwater is the green square. So and this, is, this includes Miami and other aquifers. Um, we use about um, total water use for public supplies, a little over two and a half billion gallons a day as of 2005. And the total water use in the state, including agriculture and public supply, was about 4.2 billion gallons a day. Uh, out of 150 billion gallon a day in income, that's not so bad, okay? Um, it's, we could use less water, but it's still, it's not that much out of 150. The problem is uh, the groundwater that we use, and the groundwater use is very high. Uh, these are the actual a map of the permits that have been issued by these three water management districts, the Southwest Florida, District, the St. John's District, the uh, Suwannee River Water Management District, and these these give the amounts, uh, the number of permits, the size of the permits. Um, the an, an average permit actually in the St. John's District is close to 500,000 gallons a day, and they're almost all the permits are for agriculture. Uh, but the total permitted, the total number of permits is about 30,000. Uh, the permitted amount is 4.6 billion gallons a day. That's the permitted amount, and that is almost half of the total income to the aquifer. In other words, the existing permits allow the legal withdrawal of about half the water in the, that's feeding the Florida aquifer. In other words, half the water that would have been coming out of springs. The, total, the existing permits are adequate to reduce the spring flow by over 40%, 40 or 50%. Um, and the actual pumping rate, best guess, as of 2010, was 2.6 billion gallons a day, or about 26% of the total recharge to the aquifer. You can see where the pumping is occurring. Our, our Gainesville well field shows up big time. Even in old maps of changes in aquifer levels, it shows up. And that's, that's Gainesville is the blue part of that. We have a lot of agricultural pumping. The green is agriculture, and blue is uh, urban. See Orange County. The big circles though, are Polk County, Orange County, Hillsborough County, and Duval County in North Florida. Those are the big counties. Volusia, and you can see, and, and they're pumping, you know, on the order of over 200 million gallons a day in those, those counties. Um, in Polk County, a lot of it's agriculture and industrial, uh, the phosphate mining. But in Hillsborough County, Pasco County, it's mostly urban. And then in the Suwannee River District, you see it's almost all agricultural, the gray colors. Anyway, every time you put a well in, you create a cone of depression. And so the static water level in the aquifer, say, is here, this dashed line. Put in a well, you put a, a pump down, and usually it's a submersible pump, uh, or you have a surface pump. 
to pump water out of the well. And to supply that water, the aquifer responds by creating this cone of depression. It's basically like sucking on a Slurpee. You're going to pull the levels of, of liquid in your Slurpee down around that straw. And, and so this is a straw. It's pumping very hard. And to supply that water, it's got to be coming from somewhere. It's got to be coming from the water that's stored down here. It creates a cone of depression. And uh, basically, a hyperbolic uh, curve never comes to zero. It basically goes to infinity. And so there's only a couple million of these in Florida now. You know, we have 1,000 springs, and we have, what, 2 million wells or so in Florida. We have the 28,000 big ones uh, but uh, North Florida. But we've got millions of wells. And they all have a cone of depression. Every one, when the pump's turned on, has a cone of depression. What that does is it pulls down the surface of the aquifer. And, and so you can plot that. And you can see uh, rainy years and dry years, rainy years, dry years. This is a well, a monitoring well. It has a fairly long record up at Lake Butler, which is north of Gainesville. And it's, it's gone down about uh, 20 feet or so over this period of time. Well, 20 feet in the reservoir as big as this one is, turns out it's a lot of water. It's going down about, uh, about an inch a year or so, a little over an inch a year, but that's about 350 million gallons a day of, as, this, as our aquifer goes down. That's storage. It's lost. About, about you know, 350 million gallons every day is lost uh, of storage. So that quadrillion becomes you know, trillions and then billions, but we're not there yet. But we still, there's a lot of water in the aquifer, but the, the amazing thing is that the amount of pumping we're doing is having a really measurable effect on, le on aquifer levels. Uh, and this is a graph prepared by the Florida Geological Survey showing those effects up through 2000. From what is considered pre-development to 2000, the aquifer was drawn down in these areas of pink and red. Um, the greatest drawdown was down in, in Tampa, Polk County area, Hillsborough and Polk County. You saw the pumping rates down there. There's very little recharge down there. So when you pump water out of the ground, it can't recharge locally. It has to come from other areas to, uh, to satisfy those, that pumping. And so, and it, but it draws down the area a lot. So it's gone down more than 60 feet in the Tampa area. Uh, Jacksonville's gone down more than 30 feet, uh, 30 up to 60 feet. Um, and even in the spring shed of Silver Springs, you see pink where the aquifer has gone down as much as uh, four to 20 feet, uh, even in the Silver Springs spring shed and the Rainbow Springs shed. That's why those springs have less flow now than they did in the past. And that's why the springs on the coast over here have less flow is because this, we're drawing down the aquifer. The U.S. Geological Survey delineated the spring shed for the Suwannee River Springs uh, years ago in 2007 for the, the Suwannee River Water Management District. This is a potentiometric map here. So they could draw uh, lines that showed where the, what the direction of groundwater flow was. And this is the Suwannee River here. And, and so that was really neat. And then they drew how that had changed over time. And uh, uh, they went back to uh, different uh, potentiometric maps. And they found that the spring shed boundary that used to be out here now had moved uh, 60, 50 to 60 miles uh, further uh, away from uh, or towards the Suwannee River. In other words, the spring shed had declined by this area of gray here um, as of 1980. And, and that's an estimated recharge that was lost of 80 million gallons a day. And so what's causing that? Well, what's causing it is pumping in the Jacksonville area. Remember I showed you the decline there. That is basically to satisfy the 100 million gallons a day that's being pumped in Jacksonville, uh, water's got to come from somewhere because it's not recharged there. There's no recharge to the aquifer. So it comes from the nearest places, which is, it, this actually extends all the way around because there's another spring shed over here. Uh, it comes from Keystone Heights. It comes from the Santa Fe River. It comes from the Suwannee River. And this is how that groundwater divide has moved over time. Well, as of, of 2000, it added up to about 120 million gallons a day of less flow from our springs right here in High Springs in the Itchtuckney and the Suwannee River. And so what I call it is the limestone pipeline. You know, there was a talk in Florida, if any of you are as old as I am, of putting a pipeline between Tampa and the Suwannee River, because the Suwannee River was the Saudi Arabia of water in Florida, is what they said. And they actually held a, a public hearing in Cheekland, right? But over 1,000 people showed up and said, you ain't taking our water to Tampa. 
Well, they didn't need to. The pipeline was already in place, and Tampa's <laughs> been taking our water the whole time, and Jacksonville's been taking our water. I mean, it's everybody's water, but we're um, distributing it unbeknownst to us in, in natural pipelines underneath our feet. The Florida Aquifer is one mass of limestone interconnected with conduits. This is a big pipeline. Uh, this is one of the wonderful things about the Florida Aquifer. Doesn't matter, this is the peninsula of Florida that you're looking at here. From south to north, there's Polk County. Here's the Swanee River up here. Uh, it doesn't matter where you live around here. You put a well in the ground, you've got Florida Aquifer water. Good, potable, fresh water. This is the entire flow of the Swanee River in 2011. And, and Jacksonville, what, us? We're not taking any water. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's, that's where the water's going. A lot of it is. That, used to, that water used to come out of the Swanee River, out of the springs in the Swanee River. So it's, it's like a checking account. Uh, there's a budget. Um, we, there's uh, expenses you can't uh, not have like you know insurance and like utilities and things. I mean, it's just our way of living. Well, here it's evaporation is the expense from the water budget. If if we did away with evaporation, we could live in a dome and it'd be a desert outside. That's what would happen. But it's a it's an unavoidable expense. But then there's all the other things we do to use water, and we just got to stop denying that we're having an effect on this water cycle. We are having an enormous effect on it. It shows up. It's a good thing our springs. You know, we can do mass balances, water mass balances on them and, and see where the water's going. And, and pumping is the one thing that's changed. Rainfall may have changed, and we can quantify how much that has changed spring flows, but pumping is the, the main thing for all these declines in spring flows. So here's what we know about spring flows. The, the first estimate uh, from the first magnitude springs, just our biggest 27 springs was 6 billion gallons a day. And then there was an estimate later on that was 8 billion gallons a day from 300 known springs. And then uh, 700 plus springs, uh, Harley Means came up with an estimate of 9 billion gallons a day. Well, we've, we've done now all the springs and uh, used USGS data where, where we didn't have data to fill in. Uh, and it was about 10 and a half billion gallons a day uh, during the earliest part of the record back maybe 11 billion gallons a day in Florida Springs, but I, I use about 10 and a half billion gallons a day as sort of the baseline that we should be going with for springs. And that spring flow actually went up through the 60s. We actually had greater spring flow. You remember the rainfall going up gradually? But uh, since then, we've just been on a downward trend and the percent change the last um, four decades, 16%, 20%, 13%, and we're continuing down. So as of 2000, um, the end of this decade, which was 2010, is about a 32% reduction in all our springs. I mean, 32% of the flow of the springs was gone on average. And that's average. Remember, there's dry years where there's no recharge? Well, it's over 50% already, based on the pumping we're doing. And like I said, we have, there's just as many permits out there that aren't being used as there are being used right now. So people can double their pumping right now just based on the existing permits and we still can't get the water management districts to stop issuing new permits. Uh, so you can actually take that out by water manager district. Here's a number of springs in the northwest, uh, the St. John's, the Swanee River, the southwest Florida water manager district. Uh, here's the historic flow of those springs based on the records that we have. And the biggest flow was in the Swanee River spring system. That's what was feeding the Swanee River, about 4.7 billion gallons a day of flow. Here's the current flows from those springs about a, almost half of the flow has gone from the Swanee River Springs. And that includes the Santa Fe and Swanee River Springs. Uh, that's the Swanee River drainage. So about half of the flow, based on the best estimates that exist right now, is gone from those springs on average. And um, Southwest Florida, only 18%. And, and why is that? Well, they're at the coast. They're lower springs. Those, are, those springs are pirating flow from the ones near the center of the state. Anyway, the recharge, you, I've got to, we've got a figure that gives the recharge for each of these places, and what it shows is the Suwannee River is, is essentially being sucked dry by the other water management districts. The amount of recharge uh, in southwest Florida, they're pumping uh, over half of their recharge. Their spring flow reduction should be 50% if there was really a boundary around the district, but there isn't. So the water's coming in from the Suwannee River district. The Suwannee River is only pumping like 18% of their recharge, and yet 
we have the biggest flow reduction in the Suwannee River because it's the area of highest recharge. Uh, there's the least amount of re uh, reduction in the groundwater level because it's such high transmissivity, uh, but it's where everybody else is taking their water from. So just to, to demonstrate some of these flow reductions, Silver Springs had the highest uh, recorded flow of any spring system. Uh, actually, Kings Bay is up to 900, but Silver Springs is thought of as a discrete spring. It was over 800 cubic feet per second through most of history started declining incredibly in the 1970s and 80s, and it's just uh, crashing, continuing to go down. And, and, and Rainbow's going down too, but not as fast. And that's because Rainbow's getting some of the lost flow from silver, I'm, I'm convinced of that. We've known that for years. Uh, the total loss of these two systems, about a 230 uh, million gallon a day decline as of 2010 or so. Uh, this is the one about the percentage recharge. So, in the St. John's District, they're pumping. The current pumping is 64% of their recharge. The existing permits would be 100% of their recharge, the permanent amount. And same thing in Southwest, they're pumping 50% of their recharge, but the permits would completely negate spring flow. If we did build a wall around these districts and didn't let them have our, our limestone pipeline, uh, they, their springs would stop flowing. They would have probably already stopped during dry years like ours have because springs flow from the top of the aquifer. If you have multiple holes in the bucket, um, the, the springs that are highest are the first ones that stop flowing. And on the Santa Fe River system, I like to talk about it, the Worthington Springs is the upstream most spring on the Santa Fe River. It stopped flowing in the 50s. Santa Fe Springs, a really big spring, probably the biggest spring on the Santa Fe River, and it intermittently stopped flowing. It used to be a first magnitude spring. It's, it's very rarely now. Um, and then uh, Poe Springs, basically, well, Hornsby Springs stopped flowing most of the time, and Poe Springs stopped flowing in 2012. So as you have a, as you have a drought, it starts exposing where the, where the water's gone. You know, when you have a drought, it's like a low tide, but that's, that exposes when we're overpumping the aquifer. And, and John um, has paired, I've paired, and he's paired this picture from the 1920s of White Springs to the current or the condition in 2011, the last big drought we had, where White Springs is a sinkhole under those conditions. Uh, Worthington Springs, they built a wonderful park there, a little late. Uh, Poe Springs, these are flow data for Poe Springs. The pre-1972 average flow for Poe Springs was over 70 cubic feet per second. During uh, the period 2000, 2011, the average was 45. Uh, it actually went to essentially zero flow in 2012 before uh, tropical storm Debbie. So um, we, we, we really don't have a water problem. We have a water use problem. We have so much water. We are so rich. And, and it just was like, it's one of these um, natural resources that we've just taken for granted and we've used unwisely and we haven't been efficient in our uses and we use it for crazy things. We're using our groundwater, our very best water, to water our grass, which is insane. It would be listed as insanity anywhere else. Welcome, come on in. You're in the right place. A little, a little late, uh, but uh, it, yeah, but it's it's crazy what we're doing. And so you're going to hear a lot about that. It's one of John's wonderful pictures. Another one of John's wonderful pictures. I rely on John a lot. Um, so we can we can do something about this. The subsequent lectures talk about. Uh, the water chemistry, what's happening to the biology, and then uh, what we can do about these things.